at the University of Ottawa. Uh, and so I'm going to use comparative experimental evolution uh, and antibiotic resistance in clinical strains of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So when I started my when I started my graduate degree, um, headlines were kind of inundated with things saying antibiotic resistance is now a global threat, antibiotic resistance threatens everyone. So I was seeing these headlines everywhere and they were uh, a really motivator, a big motivator for my PhD research. And so a lot of them stem from this report from the World Health Organization that outlined that we could be about to enter a post-antibiotic era. And of course this is really detrimental to all human health and they said this because there were very high rates of resistance in all regions of the world that they surveyed in all of the common pathogenic microbes that really impact human health. And what this report also really highlighted was that there was a lack of information on many pathogens of public health importance. Um, and so from this, I would say that there's a growing need to better understand all aspects of antibiotic resistance, including its evolution in genomics. Um, and so that's what I'm really interested in and will speak to you today. So just as a quick primer, uh, bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics through four main mechanisms. The top three uh, involve transfer, um, transfer of DNA from the environment. So it can be through conjugation, which is when um, they gain resistance from another bacteria of the same or different species. It can be through transformation, where there's uptake of naked DNA from the environment. And it can be through transduction, um, so from things like bacteriophages. But I'm going to focus on de novo mutations that confer resistance. So this bottom circle here. So the main motivating question for the project I'm going to talk to you about today is how repeatable is the evolution of resistance across genetic backgrounds? Uh, and so I'm really going to refer to parallel evolution a lot. And when I say that, I mean independent evolution of the same phenotype or genotype in response to a shared selective pressure. So in this case, I assume that when I do experimental evolution these, and um, the selective pressure is an antibiotic, this is going to result in resistance. And um, we had the expectation that it would likely be highly repeatable across genetic backgrounds. So why might different strains have different degrees of parallel evolution? Could, they could have differences in mutation rate, either across the whole genome or at different genes of interest, um, or there could be epistasis or epistatic effects. And so when I say epistasis, I mean the fitness effect of a mutation is modified by its interactions with other genes or mutations in the genome. So in this case, a resistance mutation would interact with different genetic backgrounds um, differently. So in some cases it could be costly, in some cases it could be beneficial. And so I think that also um, similarity or the probability of parallel evolution could be explained through differences in, in, how, um, in genetic distance, so how related species are. If they're more related, I would assume that they would adapt more similarly. And, and also um, in terms of ecological divergence or phenotype. So to explore these questions, I'm going to use a model system in uh, microbial experimental evolution. So the, my bug of choice is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's uh, an opportunistic pathogen and is a huge source of infections within hospitals. So there's this really applied aspect to this work. It's the most common cause of chronic respiratory tract infections in cystic fibrosis patients. And in this case, it quickly develops resistance to a lot of antibiotics including a class called fluoroquinolones, which I'll be using, and this, these are used in the treatment of cystic fibrosis patients. So to recap, I'm going to use experimental evolution of Pseudomonas aeruginosa as a model system to test how frequently resistance is acquired in parallel. This is my experiment, experimental setup. So what you see... Yeah, I'm going to pull There we go. So what you see here are, I have four initial starting strains. So on the left, you see there's two from chronic cystic fibrosis infections. So these bacteria have been residing within the lungs of the human patients probably for years on end. So they've experienced many, many generations of selection. Um, and they're called strains 313 and 322. So they were isolated from cystic fibrosis patients uh, within Ontario and Canada. Um, on the right, we have acute strains, so they were isolated from things like wound infections, so they had just come from the environment, they hadn't had very much um, interaction with things like the immune system, and they're also frequently used within lab studies. So I would say about 90% of lab studies use these strains, and they're called either PA01 or PA14. So this is my basic experimental setup. I had eight replicate evolving populations from each of these four different genetic backgrounds, and I um, grew them in constant superfluxes and concentration for about 200 generations. And then I wanted to see what happened. So how did they evolve? So first, I asked, are they resistant? So 
our expectation is obviously that they'll be able to grow and so they become resistant. Um, so this measure I'm using here on the y-axis is a fold increase in MIC or minimum inhibitory concentration. And so this is the minimum uh, concentration of superfloxacin in this case, which kills, um, which will inhibit growth. And then you can just see the strain along the bottom and each of these point is a, points is a replicate population. And uh, what you can see here is that all populations become resistant, um, but strains evolving from P14 or one of those lab adapted strains uh, become the most resistant. I was also interested in, um, in quantifying how much better they grew within the lab. So for this, I quantified their maximum growth rate. On the left, you can see what their growth rate is in the absence of drug, and in the right is in the presence of drug. So if you look on the left, the dashed lines represent the fitness of their, or the growth rate of their ancestor. So what you see is that in all cases, there's a significant decrease. And this corresponds to a cost of resistance, which is quite common. So you see that in the absence of this antibiotic selection pressure, whatever resistance mechanisms um, arise actually incur some sort of cost when they're not needed. Uh, on the right, you actually see their growth in the selective medium. So this is in the presence of ciprofloxacin. Uh, and there's no significant differences in growth rate uh, between all of these different populations. So you see that they, they begin to grow uh, and they all grow equally well. What I was really interested though, wasn't in patterns at the phenotypic level, it was in, in the genetics. So really which mutations underlie resistance mutations in which backgrounds. So I did whole genome sequencing of these lines and I know that this is kind of a busy schematic, but it's not important really which genes these are. So these are all, each row corresponds to a different gene and each column is a different population and they're grouped by family genotype. So first I'm gonna talk about this top box and these are known superfloxacin resistance genes. So we know a lot about the drug target. So the drug target is DNA gyrase and DNA topoisomerase. So often resistance, is, um, resistance arises through mutations in these targets. So that's gyrase A, gyrase B. And the other way that resistance um, often occurs is through um, mutations in a negative regular efflux pump. And this results in decreased intracellular concentrations of a drug, the drug within the bacterial organism. So, at the outset, we expected to see many mutations and a high degree of parallel evolution across strains because this is what we know. This is what we thought we always see you know, in the clinic and in the lab. Um, but as you can see, that's not necessarily what we saw. So here, this is strain P14, even though it's lost to four. Um, and you see that there is a high degree of parallel evolution. Many of these strains have multiple mutations within these expected and known resistance genes. In PA1, we see this to a slightly lesser extent, and we only see mutations in DNA gyrase. What was um, most unexpected, however, was um, in these chronic clinical strains, um, so strains 313 and 322, where in almost all cases, we saw no known resistance, uh, no mutations in these known resistance genes. And so this was a really surprising result. Um, and so what we take away from that, first of all, is that there's a much wider array of genes that can confer resistance than we initially thought. Um, and so future work is going to go ahead and try and identify these genes. So we're going to use allelic replacements. We're going to take each one of the mutations that arose. So for example, all of these unique mutations from strains 313, take them each and individually put them into the ancestor and see if they confer resistance. Uh, and in that way, we'll identify novel genetic targets of superfloxacin resistance. So here you can see the other really surprising result here is that most of the mutations are unique to genetic background. And we didn't really expect this either, not just because of the shared um, superfloxacin selective pressure, but because these strains are adapting to the same lab environment. So we expected secondary changes to also occur that just made them, growing better, made them grow better you know, within a test tube in the lab. And we didn't see that either. So this is a pretty surprising result. And I'm going to spend the rest of this talk um, explaining some of the ideas we think we thought might explain it in future work that we're still ongoing to try and find um, the mechanism that's really driving this. So I quantified directly how much parallel evolution there was, both within, so here in the circles, within the eight replica populations, or between strains. And so this is just a measure of similarity. So you can read this as in strains. The eight replica populations that evolved from the P14 ancestor were at 30% similar, or 30% of their mutations were in the same genes. Um, and so you see the highest degree of parallel evolution was within P14, and you'll recall that's the one that had all of those mutations in the known resistance genes. Um, and the lowest degree of parallel evolution with, was within the group of 313 there, and, and there were no shared mutations 
um, with strains that evolved from the starting genotype. So we were interested in asking, in uh, seeing if we could think of any measures that would kind of explain this probability of parallel evolution. So we asked the question, does the probability of parallel evolution, genomic evolution, decrease with increasing genetic similarity? Um, and so you see genetic distance here, and this is based on whole genome sequences of these strains. And these filled circles uh, are what this, um, are uh, the between strain comparisons, and, and there's no correlation, so it doesn't appear that that has anything to do with the probability of parallel evolution. Um, and we were also interested in asking the same question, but about ecological similarity, and that's because, as I told you previously, two of these strains have been growing within the human lung um, for thousands of generations, and so they have two, they occupy really two distinct niches. So I uh, measured 10 different phenotypic traits and obtained a measure of phenotypic divergence, and again, there's no correlation between phenotypic divergence and the probability of parallel evolution. So we kind of went back to the drawing board and thought about more proximate causes that could um, explain this, and we thought about mutation rate, and we thought about epistasis. So we did a fluctuation assay, which allows us to assess the overall genomic mutation rate for these different strains, and we found that the strain that had the lowest degree of parallel evolution had a significantly higher mutation rate. But we, in order to explain this, I really wanted to try and think about ways of measuring mutation rate at these different genes, not just overall. So in this fluctuation assay, um, it measures spontane the number of spontaneous mutants in response to superfloxacin. So we measured, we PCR'd all of those resistant mutants that we got from each of the strains um, and looked to see if the resistance mutations were within these genes. Um, and so what we expected was we would see this huge number in PA14 and almost none in strains 313 and 322. So we saw differences, but we didn't see the pattern we would expect. So we're not entirely convinced that this is the whole story. So my work that's ongoing right now back at Ottawa is to look at epistasis. So what we're doing is taking mutations that occurred within P14 in these gyrase genes or these negative regulators of efflux pumps, and we're actually putting them into the other genetic backgrounds, and then we're going to measure their fitness and their resistance to see if they're epistatic effects. And so the type of result that would explain the results we have would be if we put a gyrase mutation, say, into one of these chronic clinical strains and found it has really low fitness. So that would be one of the explanations that would explain why they just don't arise in these populations. So overall, we found this um, lack of gen genomic parallel evolution between clinical strains that was really surprising. It's not what we expected. We found that there was a unique genetic basis to ciprofloxacin resistance in many of the isolates, especially in strains isolated from chronic infections. And so future work is going to identify novel genes that confer ciprofloxacin resistance. We found that um, certain the genome architecture, and not just the strong selective pressure that is into the growing in the presence of antibiotic, determines adaptive trajectories to resistance. And methodologically, we think that this lack of parallel evolution really highlights the possible pitfalls of using just a single model strain to make broad applied conclusions. So using a single model strain like P14, we would say that resistance is always because of a handful of genes and then we did this experiment with a number of genomes and found it's not just a handful, there's really a broad number of evolutionary trajectories that confers to the floss and resistance. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you guys for coming today um, and my funding sources, and I'll take questions. Yeah. So Cipro is, I think, a form of quinolone. Yeah. So would you anticipate a similar response to other classes of antibiotics in that you would see a number of different genes able to confer resistance, or do you think that's unique to the fluoroquinolone class? I think, in some ways it's I think in some ways it's unique to fluoroquinolone, so I wouldn't expect this to drugs like rubampicin, where it has a single target like RPOV, and it, you can kind of sequence RPOV and not do whole genome sequencing, and, and be pretty certain that you're going to find a single mutation, so I think it's unique to antibiotic groups that have multiple resistance targets. But yeah, I wouldn't say it's, you know, brought across all classes of antibiotic. And I think I'm out of time, even though there's no chimes. Okay, so thanks. <laughs>